Welcome to our webinar on project-based learning for all. Uh, we're going to wait a few minutes for people to get in. Um, we have over 1,400 people <laughs> registered. So um, if you are coming to the webinar on project-based learning, you're in the right place. Just give us a few minutes. Um, as you come in, if you'd go to the chat button and tell us where you're from, uh, that would be great. And if you already have a question about project-based learning, you can put it in there as well. If you're just joining us, welcome. My name is Dr. Cindy Moss. I'm the VP of Innovation for Defined Learning, and we'll be emceeing our webinar today on project-based learning for all. I see we have people from all over the country, from other countries, so please go to the, to the chat button, tell us where you're from, and if you already have a question about project-based learning, you can put it in there, and we'll try to make sure we get to those questions today. And we have more than 1,400 people registered, so it'll take a few minutes for people to get in. Well, all across the country, Washington State, California, Virginia, Texas, Iowa, Georgia, Alabama, Kentucky, all over. Well, I see we have a North Carolina person. I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. So, wow, Kuwait, welcome. Lisbon, Portugal, welcome from all over the world. You're in for a treat today. This afternoon, we are going to have uh, John Larmer and Dr. John Spencer sharing their expertise in project-based learning for all. So we're very excited that you're here. And we'll just wait a few more minutes for people to get logged in because we have a very important message and we wanna make sure that everyone who's trying to get in can get in. Okay, it looks kind of like it's slowed down just a little. Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Dr. Cindy Moss. I'm the VP of Innovation for Defined Learning. Um, formerly, I was the Director of Pre-K-12 STEM in the Charlotte Mecklenburg School Systems, where we use project-based learning in STEM to decrease the achievement gap. You're in for a real treat today, and uh, John Lomer can go to the next slide. Um, we have our presenters today. We have John we're going to, you're going to learn about what is project-based learning. And presenters today, we have John Larmer. He's the senior PBL advisor for Define Learning and has been with us since November, 2021. He's been a thought leader and expert on project-based learning for more than 20 years. He helped build the Buck Institute for Education, now known as PBL Works, where he served as its editor in chief. He co-developed their model for gold standard PBL, contributed to the creation of the framework for high quality PBL. And he's the author of many blog posts and several books on PBL, including Setting the Standard for Project-Based Learning, an ASCD bestseller in 2015. He recently wrote a book for K-12 teachers called Teaching Civics Today, a subject he's especially interested in. He began his career as a high school social studies and English teacher in California. Welcome, John. Thank you for being here. And you are you participants are definitely going to enjoy what John shares with you. Our second speaker will be Dr. John Spencer. He's a former middle school teacher. Bless you, John, for being a middle school teacher. And he's a current college professor who's passionate about seeing kids re their, reach their creative potential. He's the co-author of the best-selling books, Launch, Empower, and Vintage Innovation. In 2013, he spoke at the White House sharing a vision for how to empower students to be future ready through creativity and design thinking. So get prepared, put on your thinking caps. As you hear our speakers today, if you have questions or comments, please put it in the chat and I'll be glad to get back to you. So John Larmer, take it away. All right, thanks, Cindy. Uh, welcome everyone, glad to be with you today. I'm coming from California. And um, as Cindy said, I've had a long career in, in project-based learning and I'll be uh, sharing with you sort of a brief sort of overview of project-based learning uh, before we hear from John Spencer. Just to make sure we're all on the same page and have a common understanding of what, what project-based learning is and is not. And so the, one of the main points I like to make is that project-based learning is the main course, not the dessert. So we're gonna explore that idea with the next few slides. Here's a, a example of a piece of student work from elementary school, the Habitat Research and Diorama Project. You might've seen these, it's a little shoebox with um, student made a, a little model of a rainforest. 
uh, in the shoebox with with you know fake grass and water and so forth and trees and plants. So that is called the uh, Habitat Diorama Project. But uh, that's what I would call a dessert project, which doesn't mean, by the way, it's 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 bad. There are, there's a place for this kind of work and this kind of project, uh, if, if you will. But it's not project-based learning exactly. What if instead of kids building a diorama in a shoebox, what if this were the main course project, also having to do with habitats and science, but where students are actually sort of working with uh, people from the local zoo, where they learn that new habitats are, are needed for some new animals that are coming from different parts of the world, perhaps. And so students learn the science, design habitats, and write proposals uh, for their habitats for these animals, and present their final plans to actual professionals from the zoo. So that's an example of this, uh, the same content is learned, or perhaps even more. Because in, when you're building a diorama, what are you really learning? You've been taught all the material first, and then you're, you're asked to go off and build the diorama. Uh, the content is taught the traditional way. The diorama really is a, like I said, the dessert at the end of, a, end of the meal. It's not the meal itself. But in this case, the students are, are given this, this challenging issue to deal with, and that's what creates the need to know the content, and that's what drives their learning throughout the course of the unit. And there's still room for some instruction, you might even call it traditional instruction within the unit, but students are driven by this uh, engaging uh, real world task. So that's main course project based learning. You've probably uh, seen a lot of examples of dessert projects over the years. I know when I was in fourth grade in California, making a model of the one of the California missions was uh, something all students did. And we learned them about the missions traditionally in the history, in history of the Spanish in California and the Indians. And then um, we all went off and built our own missions at home. And the kids who had their parents help them, of course, had the better looking missions when they came back to school the next week. But that's a dessert project. It wasn't how we learned the content. Again, not bad, but not project-based learning. So here are some different types of projects. So the, the, the dessert, or maybe it's a side dish. It's not the end of a unit, but maybe it's just sort of alongside a traditional unit. And typically it's where students make something like a, like a model or a diorama or maybe a poster. Uh, they might maybe do some research on a famous inventor or my son did one on a famous mathematician in high school math and he came back and made a, make a presentation or a poster about the thing you've researched. And again, that's not bad. Students are learning something, uh, perhaps especially in the research kind of side dish, but it's not the way the content of the course is typically taught. Um, it's usually done at home, it's not done in school the way PBL should be, it's not done working in teams, which I think PBL should be at least uh, much of the time. Uh, students might choose the topic, the, the, the mission they want to build or the habitat they want to build the model of, but they're pretty much just following the teacher directions for how to complete the assignment. And learning important content is not the goal, like I said. Uh, next step up would be the, an applied learning experience. And that's where the project is done after traditional instruction to sort of apply what was learned. It's also called a capstone project sometimes. This might be necessary sometimes, for example, in a math course or a world languages course or other kinds of courses where students need a certain amount of fundamentals before they can apply it to anything. This kind of project might be appropriate. And um, they're often great ways to sort of end a semester or end a course with a, you know, a big project that might even be real world and have all the features of of good project-based learning. But again, that's not sort of the, the well, I hesitate to call it the purest form, but that's not um, true project-based learning, which uh, when it's the main course, the knowledge and skills are learned by doing the project. It creates this need to know that engages students. So the project is the framework for whatever comes next. The, all the teachers instruction, working with experts in the real world, doing research, using other materials for students online. That, that's how that's truly main course project based learning and it's it ends with some kind of a public presentation which we'll discuss in a minute um so here's a, a another visual way to think about the difference between doing projects versus project based learning i hear this from schools a lot and, and teachers they say oh well we do projects but are they really doing project based learning so here's the typical sequence of a traditional unit with a dessert or applied learning project at the end this is a simplified version, of course. It might it might be more than just lectures and teacher-directed lessons. There's activities, there could be field trips, there could be 
guest speakers. You could be watching a video. Lots, lots of things will happen during the course of this, but you get the idea. It's presentation of material. Some sort of reviews happen. There are quizzes. There's some formative assessment going on, perhaps. More material is taught. There's a review and a final test. And then, OK, time for the fun project. Time for dessert. But here's what a project-based learning looks like, uh, project-based learning unit looks like. It starts with the launch of the project. There's engaging task is, is, is presented to students, or sometimes they can even find their own engaging task. They find local problems or issues in their community that they want to investigate and, and help address. A driving question for the project is introduced. Uh, students generate a list of questions they have about the, the topic and the project, and they're off and running. That begins the inquiry process to answer those questions. Then comes the building knowledge and skills phase where it could be a combination of teacher directed lessons and other more traditional kinds of resources for students, but also talking to experts, uh, labs, reading material, different kinds of activities, workshops. And there's room in, in there for some traditional assessments like quizzes and other checks for understanding. A lot of formative assessment going on here in these two middle sections. And then students begin to develop the products, the answers to their driving question with creating drafts and prototypes for their products, or perhaps it's a, it's a presentation answering a driving question. They're getting feedback, critique and revision cycles are happening. It's iterative process, a lot of reflection going on. What are we learning? How are we learning? How are we growing? And finally, at the end is a, a presentation that students share their work of some sort. Maybe not always a formal presentation to an audience. It could be just making their work public online or unveiling the mural on the side of the, of the building in their town or lots of different ways to make uh, work public and work should be made public even earlier in the, pro in the project too when they're perhaps comparing their work with with what experts uh, are helping them with so that's the difference between doing projects and pbl uh, cindy mentioned the framework for high quality project-based learning which was developed by lots of different organizations uh, it was uh, facilitated the process was facilitated by the buck institute for education when i was a part of it about uh Four years ago, 2017, I think this was finalized. And the, the group came up with these six criteria for high quality projects. And so these are things that students would experience when they're engaging in high quality PBL. Uh, so the first is intellectual challenge and accomplishment. And that just gets at the point that project-based learning should be rigorous. It's not just a fun activity. It's not just for learning soft skills. It's actually for learning important content in academic disciplines. Uh, and so there's a lot of you know, critical thinking going on. It's deeper learning. And students are trying to do um, you know, high quality work in the course of a project. Authenticity, big engagement factor there that students see that projects are meaningful in the real world or perhaps to their own lives, their culture, uh, their future in terms of careers. Maybe it's a real world problem right in their school or their community or in their, um, among their peers. Lots of different kind of real world applications uh, for project-based learning, but that's what makes it engaging and feels real to students and really ups the quality of their work as well. The public product, like I said, that's where uh, students can share their work somehow. Um, and that allows uh, people to sort of discuss and critique the work too. As teachers can see what students have done, parents, community members, the wider world sort of can see what students can do. It can be very impressive sometimes. Also, it, it might lead to conversations about how can we make this work better and how could how can, um, you know, what is our school doing to produce good work and how can we do it even better? Uh, project management is a great 21st century skill for the workplace and future careers and future education for students. When you're in college, you've got to do a lot of this kind of work, manage your own work independently. So if students can learn how to, uh, you know, set time, times and tasks and uh, follow a, you know, process for monitoring their work and checking it against, uh, benchmarks, hitting deadlines, other, other constraints. It's a great real world skill to learn in the course of doing PBL. And reflection, students are thinking about you know, themselves as learners, about their ability as collaborators. Um, their, uh, what, what are we learning? How are we learning? What can we learn better? What do we need to learn, learn uh, you know, a little better to, to improve the quality of our work during those one, of, one of those iterative critique and revision cycles? So reflection is very important for sort of cementing the learning at the end and during the project. And I realized I skipped one, collaboration. Um, that's, uh, we think it's important for projects to be not just individual student projects going off and doing their own research and coming back, making a presentation two weeks later, but actual 
because in the real world, a lot of collaboration happens in the workplace. And if students can learn those skills when they're in school, it's so much better for them. Um, and it could be with other students, and it need not be for the entire project. Maybe it's just certain times during a project. But usually that team created product at the end is very powerful learning experience. And that's when true collaboration happens to create something bigger than and better than what one student alone could create. And collaboration can occur with other adults, experts, mentors as well as with other students. Okay, so that's my quick overview of project-based learning. Let's now hear from John Spencer. John? Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, oops. If you wanna unshare yours so I can yes. share mine. Okay. Um, I, I have to say that I, I laughed a little bit when you brought up the, uh, the California mission thing. I grew up in, in California and I remember I had to do a sugar cube mission of a, a model. We all did the same model. Everyone's projects looked the same, except I was the one kid who thought, you know what? would work really well with sugar cubes would be um, to use a hot glue gun. So mine got melted on the side and I made up a whole story of how aliens attacked and everything. Um, I still got a C on it. I, I managed to pass, but um, there was no thinking about the conflict of, of the missions or the challenges or the communities or it was a craft. And I was reminded of that years later when my uh, middle son was in, in, in kindergarten and he got to do a project and I asked him, you know, how's the project going? And he said, oh, we're not doing a project. We're doing a craft. And I said, well, what do you mean by a craft? And he, you know, what, what's the difference between a project and a craft? And he said, freedom. And I was stuck with, yes, that sense of autonomy. You know, what he was describing as freedom was that voice. And yet I made the same mistake. Um, my experience as a classroom te teacher was, even though I knew the difference kind of between projects and, and project-based learning, I, my first year of teaching was, my whole model of teaching social studies was the tour guide teacher. I'm deciding where we go. I'm deciding the process. I'm documenting the learning. And then when it's all done, I'll take you on this tour. And then you'll get to, to have your photo album basically of, of the tour that you went on. And the truth is I was terrified to do real projects because I might be judged, they might fail the test, it might not fit the standards. All of these fears that I was experiencing kept me from actually engaging in project-based learning. And everything changed for me with a documentary project. Um, when um, we did state testing, I had two weeks where I had students all day long. And instead of watching a video, I said, we're gonna work on a project. Now, two weeks was not long enough to work on the project. So we extended that time from two weeks to four weeks. And it was the first time we actually did projects. They did community needs assessments. They were documenting, uh, documenting um, issues in the community. Uh, the topic, the main topic that they chose together collectively was immigration and how it was impacting the local community, the challenges. Um, and it was really driven by empathy and inquiry and authentic research. And that was the beginning of realizing everyone can thrive in project-based learning. And um, I'll just point out that this was my moment when I ran into John Larmer's uh, writings and research. And really he made a distinction between a culminating project, right? That you do at the very end that's sort of small versus true project-based learning. And that was the beginning um, to do things differently for me. Um, and one of the things that I began to notice as a classroom teacher was that we needed to take a universal design approach to project-based learning. We needed to make sure all students had access to PBL. And the reason why is every time that I would have students come in, I would um, give them a questionnaire about what kinds of projects they've done. And overwhelmingly, this is what I saw. Students who were in the gifted program got to do authentic PBL. But the students I had who came in who were part of the English language learning program, which would be ELL, ESOL, bilingual education, they almost uh, overwhelmingly, it was about, 95% hadn't done any kind of project. 
my students who were uh, exceptional learners, learners with exceptionality, special education students, um, same issue. They had never had access to PBL. And I found this tragic for a few reasons. Number one, we know that when you learn through PBL, the learning sticks, right? It lasts longer. Number two, there's higher engagement. It's just better learning in terms of engagement. And number three, I realized that that would lead to deeper learning of the content while also developing critical soft skills. So the question became, how do we take a universal design approach. So I'm gonna share a few different ideas of how we can ensure that all students have access to PBL. The first idea is to empower students to self-select the scaffolds. So PBL doesn't mean you don't provide scaffolds. It means that you provide them for all students so that all students have that access. That means that every student has access to technology tutorials, to academic tutorials, um, to many workshops. So the many workshops would be that while students are working on projects during different uh, phases of a project, you know, you pull small groups, but instead of saying, you know, I'm going to pull small groups with just these students who need it, what you do is you say all these small groups are going to be optional, they're going to be many workshops, and it could be um, uh, how to do research, how to analyze the data from a needs assessment how to um, engage in online research and, and determine um, facts to back up a claim, whatever it may be, you're still providing that direct instruction, but it's targeted. And instead of doing the direct instruction first and then the project later, you're integrating it into it. And they're, they're telling you, hey, I, I think I need help with these particular standards. Language scaffolds. So this was an eye-opening thing for me, providing language scaffolds that were designed for ELL students turned out to be scaffolds that everybody used. For example, front-loading vocabulary. Even during a project, we can give access to that front-loaded vocabulary so that we can all access the language. Utilizing visuals, having plenty of visuals that uh, students can use to navigate. And again, my assumption was this was for ELL students, but I found that everybody was using our visuals, our anchor charts, our things like that. Uh, implementing sentence stems. So the sentence stems, again, were designed to be um, used for peer discourse during, um, say, negotiating ideas during an ideation phase of a, of a project, or um, to make sense out of research and sharing their research from their inquiry, or sentence stems to help them develop the questions they're going to ask for research. And again, because they're universally accessible, there's no stigma attached to quote, needing help. So what it did is it really evened the playing field because every student could have access. So we had, for example, analytical question stems, application question stems, evaluative questions. So these are just for asking those questions. Another aspect of this was to provide interdependency within the work. So interdependent would be this. If independent work is I'm working by myself, and dependent work is I'm depending on my peers or just the teacher for the learning, interdependence was this notion that when students work collaboratively, there's gonna be an overlap between self and peer, right? It's the notion that um, what we do together will be better than anything we can do on our own. And this helped fix the problem that happens sometimes of sort of the one student dominating the entire collaborative process, because you're designing it in a way where both of them are, are where every group member is depending on each other. So I'll give an example interdependency with student inquiry students are jotting down their questions initially by themselves. It gives them think time that they need they can access those sentence frames. And then clockwise, each of them shares their questions together. Now, you might have some students with lots of questions and some few, but the barrier of entry is so low that everyone can participate. And then together, each member is gonna analyze their research questions based upon where they are in terms of what they're able to do. So every member has a job as they put check marks by each research question that fits our, our criteria, 
in terms of specific fact based and on topic. So notice, no one member can dominate the entire process. So the idea is, you're, you're saying, how does this build ownership and interdependency? So students are still getting a chance to ask their own questions, but they're depending on each other. There's that personal autonomy, but there's that collaboration and empathy that they're building with each other. Another example would be having students own the project management process. So as I think about project management, it's you know, setting goals and, and um, monitoring your own progress. It's breaking down the tasks and setting deadlines. It's choosing and implementing strategies, monitoring, adjusting, and problem solving. And so this is the general idea of, of truly having students own the project management process. And I'll say this, this for me, having students own the project management process in PBL was one of the last things I let go of in terms of control. Because it was really hard for me to trust that students can self-manage. And yet, if we want them to be self-directed, they need to be self-starters and self-managers. And one of the moments where I really began to, to empower teams to own the project management process came from a moment of burnout. We were doing, um, I had 180 students, they were all working on projects. And I hit a point where I said, I am managing way too many projects. I, there must be 40, 50 projects that I'm doing and I, I can't manage this many or 30. I, I'm not sure how many it was, but I was managing way too many projects. And I began to ask myself this question, what am I doing for students that they could be doing for themselves? And project management was a huge part of it. So having them own that project management process. And again, what I love about this is every student can have access to this project management process. So what does it look like? It could be having something like um, students determining the parts of the project. So project uh, product concept, clarification of the audience, deciding their roles for who's going to be doing what, breaking down the tasks and clarifying what the solution is. Um, it can be visualizing the project. So I used the strategy for uh, product visualization where, um, I don't have a slide for this. Um, I went into a third grade classroom of a teacher that was teaching project-based learning with young students. And her class was a special education class that was self-contained. So every student was on an IEP in that classroom. And this was her process. Every group had a giant um, calendar in butcher paper and they had all put together the tasks in general on this butcher paper from day to day. And then they drew pictures on sticky notes of what they were gonna do. Now, why did they draw pictures? Because she knew from the research that students who struggle with executive function have a hard time visualizing time. So they drew pictures of what they were gonna do. And then they stuck them on the, st the sticky notes on this calendar on the wall. And then every day when they began their projects, the groups would go to their calendar, they would grab this sticky note with them and they would say, today I'm going to work on blank. What it will look like when I'm done is blank. And then at the end of the day, they would hold their sticky note and they would either put it in the done pile or they would put it to the next day. So if they start falling behind, they can see it visually because there's only so much space in the calendar. And I looked at that and I said, oh my gosh, I am completely stealing that. So that was one of the things I found to be really helpful because they were visualizing it. Another version of visualizing it was using a Trello board, right? And so my students were a little bit older. We used Trello as a process for keeping track of the project management process. And what I found to be really helpful was at first I had a project manager per group, one manager per group. And later I switched and said, the first project manager will be there for three days. On the fourth day, they'll train the next group member. And then they'll train the next group member. So each group will have a, um, a different project manager every single part of the, the phase. And what, what happens is every student, regardless of their label, learns the skills of project management through their first project that they do. 
So there is a single project manager. And as a teacher, I could say, I need all project managers over here. We're going to do a quick little scrum. You're going to tell me your progress and then go back to your groups. And now all I'm doing is checking in with the project managers and then they're rotating as a group. Sometimes it's, it's a project management log. So you have who's responsible, a due date, a status update, and you can put that onto a shared document like a Google document. It also means this idea of ownership and interdependence in assessment. So the idea is to get students to embrace the notion that they're going to fail forward. And one of the things I love about project-based learning is when you have that launch, that public product at the end, that's high pressure. Now that makes kids nervous, right? A little bit scared, but they're also gonna work harder. At the same time, by building in a revision process, you create slack that allows them to develop grit. There's the space and the freedom to make mistakes and they learn how to fail forward. Now, this doesn't mean that we embrace failure, right? We don't wanna embrace failure, but we want to embrace this idea of failing forward. And it's the notion that every mistake is another iteration towards success. So you have students engaging in uh, self-assessment, whether it's goal setting, reflection, surveys, um, using rubrics as diagnostic tools. I love taking rubrics that students have helped develop as a class and then turning those rubrics into checklists. It's peer assessment, like uh, something like this uh, peer feedback process, right? Where partners get to pitch their ideas, give clarifying questions, specific feedback, paraphrasing it back, and then making a list of future revisions. So there's a, all kinds of different ideas. Now, one of the things that I love about this is they learn how to give and receive critical feedback. So if, uh, I, I use this little grid that I developed for my students where it's all about trust and, and whether I, or not I trust my students or um, my peers in a group. And so an example would be low trust to high trust. And if there's low trust and someone gives me positive feedback, that's flattery. That's dangerous. In our world, when someone who you don't trust gives you feedback, that should raise an alarm. If there's low trust and negative feedback, that's someone being a troll. That's hating, right? And to quote Taylor Swift, the haters are going to hate, 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 hate. But the goal is to get them to see that critical feedback is something we should seek out. And that positive feedback is affirmation as well. And so they learn that if there is trust in a group, <laughs> I love that, Don, thanks. Um, if there's trust in a group, then we can learn how to give and receive both critical feedback and affirmation. And it will never be perfect. There's never a guarantee. But the goal is to integrate these ideas into the process so that every student has access to that meaningful project-based learning. All right, so I'm going to uh, give it back to John to share some of his ideas and bring it home a little bit. Okay, thanks, John. Um, let me get back to my slides here. Go back, click through all yours, sorry. Um, I want to end with a couple of thoughts about uh, equity in project-based learning since we're talking about PBL for all students because, and John alluded to this to some extent with, uh, with several other groups of students, but um, in particular, I wanted to talk about um, project-based learning versus what's been called the pedagogy of poverty. It's from a 1991 article by um, uh, Haberman, Martin Haberman. And um, I wrote a blog about it, about it a few years ago, actually, at PBL Works. And uh, I noticed one of you put a, a message in the chat about an article going back to 1980 about the kind of learning that students experience in wealthier suburban schools versus um, high poverty urban schools. So same idea. And I think all students deserve project-based learning. And we can't just say it's reserved for only certain students. Uh, this is a title of an article I wrote for the um, um, Accessibility, Compliance, and Equity magazine a couple of years ago. The project-based learning is a force for equity and all students deserve it. So I'm sort of drawing from that. And another work I've been doing uh, in the last few years, a lot of it focused on uh, racial equity. Um, I should back up for a second and say the pedagogy of poverty. If you look at the article, it's it's um, one of the Kappen uh, magazine classics. You can find it at the Kappen, and it talks about just the kind of 
it's still very much the case in many schools, um, the drill and kill approach, right? The, the worksheet driven, test prep, uh, this the really disengaging kind of teaching. And uh, project-based learning when done well, will prepare students for tests. And there's research to show that. And you can cover your standards, uh, or I shouldn't say cover, you should teach your standards more deeply with project-based learning. So um, it's really, I think there's not really much of an argument for, um, for that kind of teaching anymore. And, and it's time for PBL. Uh, it can be really transformative for students, especially students who maybe feel that school is, um, is either, a, they're see, sort of a dispiriting or even an oppressive place where they don't see themselves in the system. They, they, they're sort of, uh, they, they feel like they don't have much power in the school over their own lives, perhaps. But project-based learning can really build that sense of agency that, you know, students are tackling a real world problem or they're making a presentation to an audience of, of adults that's admiring their work. Think of how transforming that can be for many students. It gives them a real sense of power and confidence and responsibility and, you know, I can do this. It really propels them into their futures. Uh, PBL aligns with culture, culturally responsive pedagogy, which is centered on knowing your students well and uh, relationship building, which is very important in being a PBL teacher, that, that culture you'll build in a PBL classroom uh, respects uh, what students can contribute. You know your kids, you can design projects with them or for them that, that appeal to them or that are authentic to them. Um, and a lot of the practices around coaching students, questioning students, responding to their their needs, their particular interests, hearing their voice, all that's part of culturally responsive pedagogy. It aligns very well with PBL, not to mention social emotional learning, aligning, aligning very well with, with PBL also. Uh, lots of exposure to the adult world and possible careers that students might not, might not have been aware of, uh, and they, they can connect with real world experts during a project. They're out doing field work, perhaps outside of the school and the community. They're maybe partnered with some nonprofit organization out there, um, or they're making up, I heard of a math teacher in high school where students present to a local, local businesses and ways to design their packaging. So lots of, lots of ways students can connect to the world outside of school and their own, and their own little world sometimes. And uh, there's a lot of recent research, some great stuff just came out of Lucas Education Research in 2021, uh, showing that PBL worked for, um, uh, they actually raised, they use standardized tests as a measure and it raised scores for low income and high minority student populations. And this was the case, they researched um, second graders, science and literacy. And another study was uh, third grade social studies and literacy. And it showed gains in, in both reading and in uh, the subject areas. It showed gains in social emotional learning uh, uh, competencies. And so it was, it was great stuff. It was gold standard research in that it was, uh, you know, there are control groups, randomized control groups and so forth. And lots of um, students and teachers involved in, the, in that research. So check that out from Lucas Education Research. The third study, by the way, was of AP, high school AP courses in US government polit uh, civics and in uh, environmental science, which showed that students taught in a PBL approach did better on their AP exams. So that was really uh, impressive research. Uh, that showed that people, people can work it for AP, which is typically one of those cover a lot of material types of courses, right? Uh, if PBL can work in that setting, then it can work in everywhere. So I encourage you to not sort of fall back on any kind of, any, when everyone says, my kids aren't ready for PBL or our students can't do PBL, they need basic skills first. No, they, you still might have a literacy program, of course, or a math program in your school, especially in elementary, but students, all students can do PBL. So let's not withhold the good stuff from, from all students. All right, so that's the end of our formal. Oh, I wanna to, to make two little, two little comments before we go to questions and answers. Um, I was just thinking as I was planning this presentation and John and I were talking about um, experience of teacher, PBL teachers during the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And two more groups student uh, P PBL is good for, I was thinking, because this webinar's topic is uh, project-based learning for all. So, uh, and John, feel, I'll, we, feel free to chime in here. Uh, it, uh, students learning remotely, they, when they were doing project-based learning, they were still engaged. They were, um, especially if they knew PBL already, if they were just trying to learn it, you know, already being home, maybe that wasn't gonna work. But 
if they already knew PBL, they could do projects with remote learning very well. And they could still get out into their community. They could communicate with each other online in their peer groups with their teachers. And a lot of great projects were still seen during the lockdown when students uh, trying to learn traditionally via Zoom, it was not happening very well for them. It's not a very engaging way to learn. Um, and that was true of teachers too. Uh, I've always liked to like conclude by saying PBL is good for teachers. And uh, that was true of teachers during the pandemic. Uh, John, you said you noticed teachers who were using PBL seemed more relaxed, I think you said, or? Yeah, you know, one of the fun things I've gotten to do is I've done a lot of, you know, workshops and then also extended coaching um, with teachers right now um, throughout the last year and a half. And, and a lot of it's virtual, um, but, but they're teaching in virtual or hybrid or in-person. And in all of the environments, one of the things I'm noticing is that um, project-based learning is challenging at first. It is disorienting and, and confusing, but right now, so is all of teaching. <laughs> you know, it's we're all in a place that's a little bit disorienting and there's a tendency to pull back and try to go more traditional. And then that doesn't necessarily work. And what I'm seeing is that the teachers who have given project-based learning a chance, um, they seem to have higher engagement. They seem to be able to see a difference with their students and, so many teachers are feeling um, kind of exhausted right now. It is a hard time to be a teacher, right? But the overwhelming thing I'm seeing about the teachers who have been teaching um, with the PBL framework is that they are, yeah, more relaxed, um, enjoying it more. Um, you know, there's a sense that I can see the difference that's happening in my teaching on a regular basis. and it feels more meaningful. And um, on a more personal note, I personally found that um, at first, when I first started project-based learning, it was a little bit confusing and there were moments where it was exhausting, but the mo once I, I, I did maybe my second or third project with students, I found that, that I was working less and they were working more and I was coming home excited, not exhausted. And so I think on a very kind of selfish level as a teacher, it is so much more enjoyable as a teacher. And I kept feeling like I was getting away with it. And then I was talking to, to friends who did a project-based learning. I have a, a friend who's been doing PBL for a long time, Mike Cackley and my friend Trevor Muir. And they were saying the same thing. Oh my gosh, I'm not exhausted in my job. Um, and I'm excited, um, the passion is there. And so I think there is this, this element where um, it does make teaching more enjoyable. Yeah, I've heard teachers say that uh, after they've you know, done PBL for a little while, they'll never go back. It's, it's just the way they've always wanted to teach. And once they realize they can do it, it takes, as you said, it, it's not easy at first. You have some stumbles. You're gonna, not every project's going to go well. But as you and students get more used to it, they'll get better and better, and you'll see the results. And it's rewarding as a teacher to have your kids fired up about something. They're raising their hands. They're, they're asking their own questions. They're finding their own problems to solve. Imagine how different that is from, from a traditional sort of sit and, sit and rose quietly type of classroom, so. Well, and I'll just add something to that, which nobody really brought this up, but it, it is always a, a big concern is sometimes people will say, what about, you know, what about new teachers? We have so many new teachers coming in. But as a professor now, when I work with my cohort members, the ones who have gone project-based and are willing to take that creative risk themselves are finding that classroom management is easier in a PBL classroom, not harder, which was the assumption, right? So I would also say, look, even if you're newer to teaching and you're a little unsure about your classroom management, give it a chance because it really can work. Yes. Yeah, students who are really engaged are not going to be uh, messing around. That's that's the cause yeah. of a lot of misbehavior, right? True. Um, John Larmer, can you go back to the last slides just so we have the share your screen again and go to the end? While he's yeah, doing sure. that, you guys have had some great comments, great questions on the screen. And Maggie from Define Learning is going to send you a link to the recording of this. Many of you were asking, could you share it? And as John is finding the last slides, uh, I'd also invite you, you care about PBL, go to Facebook and join our group, Defined Champions. It's a group of educators who are implementing PBL. And so people are saying like, can you give me an example of a video of high school teachers doing this? Um, 
Whoops. Oops, okay. did I stop staring my screen here? Let me get back to that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Any, anyway, I, I didn't see where that is, but uh, join, is. Uh, join the Facebook group. Uh, it's free. There's all kinds of great things going on. We have monthly Zoom calls where people share successes and roadblocks they're facing and help one another. It's a great um, PLC of more than 500 educators implementing uh, defined learning, uh, implementing PBL, many of them using defined learning. Uh, also, you'll be receiving a free trial of defined learning. We have 366 PBLs for you to go search and look at. And as both Johns have said, I think when you have that format, the high quality PBL that like we have in defined learning, it makes it easier for kids and teachers to do this. So it doesn't matter if you're a brand new teacher or a veteran teacher, you can figure out how to provide this really engaging teaching and learning for all kids. So thank you for your willingness to be here. Um, you'll, you will get information from us. You'll get a certificate for participating and we look forward to connecting with you in the future around PBL and STEM. So thank you very much. Thanks everybody.